abhorrent, repugnant. Right? <coughs> and resisted the whole thought. He saw the vision, but he didn't accept it. And so God worked in his life and for some reason in verse 12. And, and Peter left out the, the, the last part of the sentence when he gave his report. But if you look back in chapter 10, verse 20, we see that the Holy Spirit actually said, Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. That's what God said. That's very important. God says, Stop. In your unbelief, stop doubting. Just go. Go with those men. Why? Because I sent them. They're not going to mislead you. They're not going to deceive you. Just follow them. So arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing. That's what God said. Why? God said it. So when you find yourself doubting, are you with me? When you find yourself doubting or questioning, just listen to the voice of God. Why? Because God can never make mistakes. He is always correct. You may not like your circumstances in life. You may not like your, your battles that you face right now, the challenges that you face right now. But God never is mistaken. And here you find that God you know, wanted Peter to know that he could trust God's leadership. That God is leading and he ought to follow. Right? And, and the Lord wants and wants us to trust in Him too. So if He's teaching Peter, then learn this lesson. God, the Almighty, the all-knowing God, all-knowing, amen, the everywhere present God, you follow Him just like David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack anything. He is my provider. He is my protector. He is my sustainer. He is the one who is going to preserve me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And what assurance do they have following the Lord? I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for how long? In heaven. How long in heaven? Forever. There will be no end to the joy and the bliss and the blessings and the peace and the beauty that you will experience in heaven. Would you trade that for something trivial? For something that's mundane and temporal? Would you trade that? Listen, God is speaking to you. Look at what is important to God. It is not your own pleasure. Are you listening? But it is the pleasure of God in you. How do I translate that into a language that we all can understand? Maybe you need to ask this question. With what I'm doing now with my life, is He being pleased and honored and glorified? And if the answer is no, then you better change your direction of your life. Amen? Amen? Because there's a lot that you will lose if you follow your own self-will and desire, which is most of the time focused on yourself. It's not focused on your family. It's not focused on your church. It's not focused on God. It's just focusing on yourself and your own pleasure. Listen. God wants you to live a life in which He is pleased. It must be His pleasure. Amen? God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in Him. John Piper said that. He is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in Him. If you don't find your satisfaction in God, there is no satisfaction in this world. Because everything is fleeting, everything is vain, <laughs> everything is temporary. And there are things that are of eternal values. And, and so he gives this, he intervenes, right, in the most miraculous way. He sends men, he sends a vision. And Peter understood that, that this is not just a uh, something that I was, you know, like this is not a nightmare. This is not something that I created in my mind with my own imagination. Now God is here and God is sending me to a man named Cornelius. And he wants me to reach out to a Gentile person. And so the message of that vision is becoming clearer to them. This is not about literally eating food. But this is about what? This is about crossing cultural barriers that have become an obstacle to the spread of the gospel. 
<coughs> Why was that? Because if you backtrack a little bit, from Acts chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, they were just reaching out to fellow Jewish people. They had forgotten that God also had included in His plan, and His program for missions, the whole world, the Gentile world. And that's why God had the temple built. My house shall be a house of prayer for the nations. But the Jewish people made it so exclusively for Jewish people. That's for the nations. Jesus went in and didn't find any Gentile inside. Got mad. It's not because they were selling a lot of merchandise. That's one thing. But the main thing is this. They didn't fulfill the very purpose of that temple. For, for, for that temple to be built. As so in verses 13 and 14, then there was Cornelius' angel. Right? God is always working to build up our faith in Him. Best and most often, He does this through His Holy Word. But listen, sometimes He performs a miracle. One of the miracles He performed in this church, I'll never forget, was when a brother that required a liver transplant. He was dying. He was given only a few, uh, few days to live. Without liver transplant, he died. But the Lord intervened. And it took 10 days before they got that liver. Can you imagine? Instead of 72 hours, the doctor said, he lasted 240 hours. If you do your math, because you have 24 hours in a day, and it took 10, 10 days before they, the, 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 the right liver finally came, and they, they performed a liver transplant, and Kuyed was alive. I had the privilege of bringing him back to the hospital many times. And I remember the first time we walked, right before members of the team, and they were like, they couldn't believe their eyes that he was alive. To them, they knew, they knew there was a miracle that took place. It was all odds against him surviving. But friends, it's the work of God. Amen? Amen? And I'm sure that you've had those kinds of uh, intervention that came from the Lord. With how He protected you. How He kept you from a damaging end, right? How He preserved your life. How He blessed you. How He made provision for what a great need you have. He never comes late. God is always right on time. He will always accomplish His purpose. His plan is perfect. Friends, there will always be provision. He will never fail. you believe that? Do you believe those things? Do you believe that God can do a mighty work in you and through you? you believe that God can intervene in your situation and God can, can change things and turn things around? Do you believe that? That God can occupy your heart and, and take full control of your life so that it's no more you in control. It's not you anymore, but it's God. Just let Him. And you have to learn how to let go and then let God. You understand? Let go. Let go of self and pride and selfish ambition and, 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 and that selfish will. All the things that you thought you'd have. Focus on God. Then you know when God takes over, it's not you. It's not about you. It's about Him being glorified in your life. But friends, think of all we would have missed. Think of all the blessings and the wonderful experience that we would have missed if we didn't allow God to take full control, to intervene, to overcome. So when you find yourself at the end of your witch, right? When there's nothing more. When, there's, when all you see is a wall and there's nothing. Wherever you go, look above. Because there's a way out. Because God is there just simply waiting. Waiting for you to reach out to Him and tell Him, Lord, I need you. I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what to do with this crisis in my life, with this, with this difficult thing in my life. I don't know how to solve this problem. I don't know how to win this battle. But when you let God take over, then He will, you know, show you the victory. And then the third thing that I see here is that God works to energize our witness for Him. So he, he enlightens us, right? He gives us understanding of His ways and His thoughts and understanding of His Word. We allow Him to speak to us and, and, and our hearts are changed and then we allow Him to encourage us and now we're given the strength. When first we were doubting, now we're believing. Remember that man who came to the Lord and said, Lord, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. I mean, that sounds like... A, a confusing statement. How can you say you believe, but then you're asking God to help in your 
unbelief. 